Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Through King David, we can learn a great deal of spiritual truth. And one aspect of that spiritual truth is how to pray effectively, how to come before our God in order that we will hear from him, that prayer will be a source of revelation to us, and also bringing before him our prayers, our supplication, our praise, and our worship. And in the end, God will move in our life, in our circumstances, that he will find glory in us, in our actions, in our words. That's what we have been saved to be, a source of glory unto the Lord. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Psalms and Psalm 28. Now, here David is bringing before God prayers, and we see that David realizes that God, although he hears always, immediately, he knows all things, we never surprise God. But the point is this, sometimes God does not immediately respond. He does not for a variety of reasons, one of which is that we need to change. And this lack of of response from our standpoint, it can have a valuable effect in our life bringing change, teaching us different spiritual truth principles that will cause us to grow and become more effective in our work, our service unto the Lord. So we read here in Psalm 28 of David, meaning it's a psalm by him. And we read in verse verse 1, Unto you, O Lord, I call. So first and foremost, we see that David is saying, and context will bear this out, David is in the midst of trials, hardships. He wants God to come to his assistance. And therefore, he seeks first, not as a process of elimination, not because everything else has failed, but David says, first and foremost, unto you, O Lord, I call. And the message here is that I will call. It's in the imperfect, which means in Hebrew, that David, he will do this. And the implication is that he's committed to do it consistently. He is not going to simply make one prayer, and if nothing happens, that's it, turn to other means. He is committed in his prayer life to God. So once again, unto you, O Lord, I will call. And notice how he addresses God, my rock. And what this is to teach us is that David realizes that God, rock, is also a a type of synonym for foundation. David is saying, I want to build my life, everything that I am, everything that I will achieve, everything that I will become, it is founded upon God. He is my rock. And he says, do not be, and this is a word for for being deaf or non-responsive, as though God is not hearing, although as we said, He hears all things. He knows all things. But at times, God appears silent. It appears to us that he doesn't hear. So David says, do not be silent. Don't be still. Don't be as if you aren't hearing me because, he says, if this is the situation, he says, lest you be silent unto me, and it's a different word. One is not hearing, the other is being still. So he says, lest that you should be silent unto me, and I will be likened 
to the ones who descend to the pit. And what he's speaking about is one who does not have spiritual victory. Now, what's the foundation of this this statement? David is revealing something, and it's this. Only through God hearing and action, not being still, not being silent. It's only when God moves are we going to be different from those that are descending into the pit. Those who descend into the pit, they have lost. They have been defeated. They do not know victory in their life. So David is teaching us if we're going to have victory, spiritual victory, if we're going to see the defeat of the enemy rather than being defeated with them, then God has got to move in our life. He's got to help, assist, give us insight, give us that power in order that we can be overcomers. And here's the key, overcomers with him. Look now to verse 2. Hear the sound or voice, this Hebrew word kol, can mean sound or voice. So David says, hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto you. And this word that I translated supplications, it's rooted in the word for, for grace. So it is a petition. It is a call for God to be gracious unto David. What does David know? He knows that nothing, and I want to emphasize that word, Nothing is going to happen that is good in your life, that brings about a God-pleasing change, that produces that which is righteous. None of those things are going to be a reality for you until you become a recipient of God's grace. In other words, until God's grace begins to move in your life. We need to see, and this is the message of, of this verse, Without the grace of God, nothing, nothing is going to be glorious unto the Lord that we can do. We are utterly dependent upon Him. And it's God's grace, and I say this frequently, it is God's grace that moves, empowers, provides those things in our life so ultimately God's will can be done in us and through us. Realize there's an inherent relationship between God's grace and the will of God. It is through God's grace that the will of God in your life can become a reality. So David says, hear my voice of supplication. When I cry unto you, when I lift up my hands unto, and the phrase here, the next word, Many people don't know this word. It's the word devere. Devere, I have an uncle. He's dead now, but his name was devere. Not a common name, but a very significant word. That word devere speaks of the Holy of Holies. So this is exactly what David is saying. When I lift up my hands, and this is lifting up your hands in this context, is an, a display of submissiveness. If we're going to see our prayers be effective, if we're going to see a response from God to our supplications, we need to come before God in submissiveness, saying, not my will, but your will, O God. Whatever you want to use me for, whatever your purpose is for me, I am committed to that. That's what it means when we lift up holy hands. Why holy hand? Holy related to the concept of purpose. So David is affirming here. He says, God, I need the grace that only you can supply in my life. I want to be used by you for your purposes. Verse three, he says, do not, and this is a word of being drawn away, moved away from being in the will of God. So David says, do not allow me that I should not be drawn away with, 
And the next word, reshaim, those who are wicked doers. David does not want to be drawn away. And here's the principle for us. This world is full of that type of individual, those who practice wickedness. If you are not a disciple of Messiah Yeshua, you are in God's eye a wicked individual. That's how we're born into this world. This is who we are as a human being who has fallen. And everyone is born into this world in a spiritual fallen condition. That is that we are wicked. And it's only the grace of God through the work of redemption that we can become a new creation. Our old self, wicked. Our new self, we are going to be moving towards and living out, displaying, and here's the key word, the righteousness of God. So this is how God sees every individual, one of two ways, either wicked or righteous. And it all depends upon us entering into that new covenant relationship. The outcome of that new covenant that is, is announced through the gospel, the outcome of that is righteousness. You will be declared righteous because of the work of Messiah, and you will not only be declared righteous, but you are going to begin to manifest the righteousness of God. Meaning this, the righteous deeds, the purposes that meet with God's approval, his righteous approval, are going to become the emphasis of a believer's life. And therefore, look at what he says here. He talks about, do not Allow me to be drawn away with wicked ones, with the actions, those who are doing. And then we have a word, aven. Aven is another word. We have the word resha, wicked, wicked one. And we have the word aven, which is a wicked deed. Two different words that express that same concept in English of wickedness. So he says in this passage, I don't want to be drawn away. I don't want to be caught up in the wickedness of this world, nor in the doers of wickedness. And what are these ones like? Well, look at the second part of verse 3. They're the ones who speak shalom with their neighbors. And what is that? Well, they're giving a false impression. You know that I associate the word shalom, not just with the concept of, of peace from a worldly perspective, not at all. It is a biblical peace. And what is biblical peace related to? Once again, the will of God. We have that peace because the will of God is a reality in our life. And when the reality of our life is not God's will, then we're not going to know that peace, that, that assurance, that comfort, that contentment. So when we look at what David is saying, he's saying there are individuals, referring to those workers of iniquity, of wickedness, he says they are going to be the ones that are speaking peace with their neighbors, but, very important conjunction. But evil is in their hearts. Now, I mentioned the word but. It's a, a conjunction of contrasts. But, but in Hebrew, we, we oftentimes see that this one letter, it's the letter Vav, it can be used and context tells us whether it should be a, a conjunction of unifying simply the word and, or whether it should be a conjunction that, that does not unify, but one that shows a contrast. In this case, it shows, obviously, they speak shalom, but their hearts, their hearts are quite different than that. Their hearts are, are concerned, committed to, the word here is ra'ah, evil in the sense that which is in conflict 
with the will of God. Look now to verse 4. Now David is praying. David wants God's action in the life of those who are God's enemies. Now, one of the things that I've said in the past, and I'll repeat myself now, if you have enemies, make sure that your enemies, first and foremost, are the enemies of God. In order that you, and if you're committed to the will of God, it takes care of itself. Because if you are laboring, if you are committed to those things that, that God wants, those things that his truth will lead you to do, if that's the case, any opposition that you, you encounter, any of those who are plotting and carrying out wickedness and evilness against you, realize they are also standing in opposition to God. A foolish thing to do. And therefore, David can pray with, with an assurance. Look now to verse 4. He says, give to them according to their action. Give to them according to their action. And according to and the word roa, which is another word for that which is evil, that which is wicked, he says, and according to their their evilness of their deeds. So we have two synonyms. We have the word action and the word deeds. And what this tells us is that it's not just the thought that is being judged, but the actions. Now, of course, as in one thinks in his heart, as one thinks in his heart, so will he practice, so will he do. And David is saying here, look and evaluate their deeds. According to their deeds, respond. And that's exactly what the Word of God teaches for example, we know that the Son of Man, Messiah Yeshua, He is coming. And He says, I'm coming and my reward is with me. To render to everyone according to His mind, His thoughts. No. It says, according to one's deeds, whether good or bad, Messiah is going to respond. So David is saying simply, He's speaking prophetically here according to their action, according to their deeds, you judge, you respond to them, O God. And he says in verse 4, the second part, and according to the work of their hands, give to them and return. Now, this is the same word in a different form for repentance, repenting. And it simply means to turn. So here, if we read this whole verse where it says at the end, the last phrase says, return their recompense, their reward, the outcome of their actions unto them. So what we see, and this can be supported in, for example, the book of Revelation, where Messiah says so many times, he says, I know your works. I know those deeds. I know the things that you are practicing. And here, once more, we see an emphasis. Now, I have to say it because if I don't, I get emails. But obviously, obviously, we are not saved. We're not finding forgiveness from our sins by good works. It is not a biblical concept to believe that if you have, you know, it's a balance, and if I have more good deeds than bad deeds, then God's going to receive me. Nowhere is that taught in the Scripture. What's taught in the Scripture is no one is justified by works. It's all a matter of God's grace, what He's done in our behalf, that grace that we talked about earlier. So by grace that you've been saved, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But do not make an improper conclusion. People think, well, because I'm not saved by works, works aren't important. No, that's not what the Word of God reveals. Works are extremely important. Not too long on ago, I spoke about another, uh, uh, spoken another message about the judgment seat of Messiah. 
that it's necessary that we all, and here we're talking about every believer, going before the judgment seat. Now, this is not the great white throne judgment. No believer will be at the great white throne judgment. This is not that great white throne, but it's rather the Bema seat. And this is a different issue entirely, and it has to do with being judged for one's works and the Bema seat of Messiah is for believers. What rewards are we going to get? So works are important. God does indeed judge, evaluate, and respond, and it has eternal implications these rewards. So rewards we want to receive, and those rewards come to us based upon our works, our deeds. So they're important, but they do not save us. Look again. He says, let's move on to verse 5. For, and here's a very important truth, one of the things that, that is going to cause these individuals to go down to the pit, not experience victory, not be instruments of God's glory, not live righteously, not experience the righteousness of God, is because, what does he say in, in verse, verse 5? Because they do not understand the works, the activities of the Lord. And one commentator said, they don't understand the activity of of the Lord. Why? They're not interested in it. They're not investigating. They're not thinking, what is God up to? How does God act? What does he do? And in order to answer those questions, we need to get to know God. And there's only one place, hear that carefully, only one place that we can learn about God. And it's a very foolish individual that looks at this world and say, well, this world, it was created. It had to be. It exists. And there is an order to creation. And therefore, there is a creator, a creator that is wise, a creator that knows a proper order, a creator that is extremely powerful. So one who says, you know, I'm not interested in knowing this one, experiencing him, that is foolish. And this is what David is referring to here when it says, verse 5, for they do not understand the activities of the Lord, nor the works, the work of his hands, what God's up to. They don't investigate in order to get to know him. And therefore it says, second part of verse 5, he will destroy them. Now, there's a couple different words for destroying. This is the word for, for really, there's some thing and it is just, just ruined. So literally, this word is better understood as ruining something. And either God is going to have, and here's the, the spiritual principle for us. God is either going to be working to edify us, to build us up. If we understand God, if we're learning about him and taking that truth and, and implementing it into our life, then we are going to see God is going to build us up. He's going to work in our life. But if we're uninterested in God, we're not investigating, studying, we're not reading his word, we're not taking truth and applying it to our life, then God is going to bring ruin into our life. Now, hopefully that ruin will come sooner than later. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the ways that, that people are brought to repentance, what a good thing to be brought to. One of the ways that people are brought to repentance is because they, they experience a life of ruin. And therefore, that ruin causes them to consider things differently. And that hopefully will mean 
that they begin to seek God. What a wise thing to do. Ignore God. Be uninterested in understanding God. Foolishness. Seeking God. Wanting to have a knowledge of God. This is all based upon wisdom. It gives to us a a new perspective that God will will work with, bring his change, bring his fluence into our life. So he says, if they're uninterested, do not want to know the work of his hands, he will destroy, he will ruin them, and he will not destroy build them he will not be edifying to them verse 6 but now david is going to to speak about his position his relationship with god what he is experiencing and it's very different for those who are uninterested in understanding god not wanting to give god any aspect of their life they're going to experience ruin eternally but those who live approach god differently based upon the wisdom of god the fear of the lord the truth seeking his grace what does david say look at verse six he says baruch hashem what does that mean blessed is the lord and this word blessed If you do a really good study of this word, meaning blessed, the concept of of blessing, to bless is the word levarech. And if you ask someone that, that truly has a good knowledge of Hebrew, can you give me another word for, for levarech, to bless, to bless? The answer is limshoch, to pull. That's why, and I've shared this before, the word bracha, blessing, is related to the word berach, which is knee. What can I do with my knees? I can sit down. It has to do with pulling down. Blessing. When we live a blessed life, we are living in a way that brings upon us, brings down from heaven the blessings of God. And that's why David is saying here concerning the Lord, Lord, you are a blessed God. What David is saying is he's experiencing God in his life. When one says, blessed be the Lord, he's experiencing God. For, notice what it says, for he has heard the voice of my supplications. Earlier on in this verse or this psalm, David is saying, hear it is in the, the, the construction of an imperative. In this case, it's pleading with God. God, hear the voice, the sound of my supplications. But now God is moving in David's life. David is experiencing God's response from heaven. That's why he says, blessed is the Lord. And in response to that, he says, for he has heard the voice of my supplications, verse 7. Now, God is moving in David's life, and notice the first thing that David says about it. Verse verse 7. Hashem Uzi. The Lord, He is my strength. What this reveals is that David knows the power of God. He's experiencing God's strength in his life. One of the ways that the word of God reveals God to us is by the term father. We speak alvinu shabishamayim, our father which is in heaven. And the concept of father goes along with provision. He is a provider. And David says, in this case, he's got those enemies, those opponents, he's experiencing opposition. David wants spiritual victory. That's what we learned earlier. He doesn't want to be with those who are drawn away and and, and fall down into the pit. But rather, David wants a different future, a different eternity. And he says, in this case, O Lord, you are my strength and my shield. The word megen, 
Megan, it's a word for shield, protection. So God, he protects us, he empowers us, he strengthens us, and it gets even better. He says, in him. Now, notice there's a change. Because earlier on, David was praying in the second person, making it very, very personal, directing things to God. But now, what is David beginning to do? He is beginning to testify, share not this with God. God knows all this. He's testifying to others. He wants us. This tells us that this psalm is for us to be given illumination from God that David has experienced personally in his life. So he says, not only is the Lord my, my strength and my shield, but he says, in him. And that's what appears next. Bow, in him. The order here shows that which is emphatic. In him. And I hope you know that that expression, in him, relates to a covenantal relationship with God, of course, through Messiah. In him, my heart has trusted. Not I, I will trust. I'm considering trusting. But he says, in him, this is David's operation of his life. David has trusted. My heart has trusted in him. And he has helped me. That's what David knows. He knows God's help. He has known it in the past. He knows it now. And he will know it in the future. David says repeatedly that God has been his help. So let me ask you a question. Can you, can you state that confidently? Can you state that with all assurance? Not simply saying, I hope that he'll be my help, but rather, I have experienced God's help. I have known his faithfulness in my life. God will, and I promise you this because the word of God declares it, God will show himself helpful in your life. If you are wise enough to enter into that covenantal relationship, to bring forth before him your prayers of supplications, to trust in him, he will act, he will move, he will help, as David says, for he has helped me. And because of that, what will David now have? Look at the second part of verse 8. My heart, this heart that has trusted in, in the Lord, that same heart, it says, will rejoice. And from my song, it says, I will praise him. And literally, realize most Bibles translate, I will praise him. But literally, this is a word for forgiving thanks. Now, there's a great similarity between giving thanks and praising, but, but literally, it's the word for giving thanks to God. What David is teaching us is that when we turn to God, turning away from a worldly perspective, a worldly objective, turning to God, we will find his provision in our life. He will strengthen us. He will protect us. God will move to bless us. We will see coming down from heaven those things that we need to live a victorious life, to manifest the glory of God, to live out the righteousness of God. All of these things, God is willing. He is omnipotent. He has the power to make that a reality in your life and my life. That's why David says, from my song, I will give you thanks. So let me ask you a question. Are you truly thankful to God? Are you experiencing his workmanship, his provision, his activity in your life that, that causes you to be thankful. If God's at work in your life, you will be thankful. You will know this blessed Lord. That's what David is promising us. Look now to, to verse 8. The Lord strength to them. That's what he's promising. God gives strength to them 
Who's them? Well, it's in the third person plural. What it's speaking about here is that God, to those who follow this, these principles, those who implement this truth in their life, doesn't matter who they are, Jew or non-Jew, male or female, none of those things matter. What race they're part of, what their ethnic group, what language they speak, none of those things interest God. Why? Because God is your creator. He's made you the way that you are. And therefore, he will, this is the implication, strength God gives to them. And he is, notice something else, some Bible translates this word meos as a, a refuge. But, but I like it better because it's the same word. When we look at the first part of verse, verse 8, it says, Adonai oz lamo, which means the Lord strength to them. And then we have that same word oz. We have the word maos. It is the same word, just in a different grammatical construction, but it's the same concept of strength. But it's referring to not the concept of strength, but a strong place. And, and I would translate this instead of a refuge, not something you just flee to, but rather I like the term a stronghold because it really reflects the, the nuance of that word oz or maoz in this case. So what God is to us, he is a stronghold of salvations. Now, not that there's different salvations, but when, when the plural is used, it's speaking about an abundant salvation. God is our stronghold, and because of that, we are going to experience abundant salvation Yeshuot. Many of you know the name of Messiah in Hebrew. I use that primarily, Yeshua. But the term salvation is Yeshua. We hear the difference, Yeshua, Yeshua. The accent is different, differently located. This is Yeshuot. It's Yeshua in the plural. So salvation, speaking about abundant salvation, he is the stronghold of abundant salvation. Who is? Well, notice how it ends. Mishicho, who? He is, and now we know who that he is. It's speaking about his Messiah. What this verse does in an undeniable way is that it unites the concept of Messiah with abundant salvation. And there's a relationship between salvation and experiencing life and experiencing life abundantly. That's what this psalm is teaching us. It is through, this is the book of Psalms. It's not the new covenant. But it tells us if you want to experience an abundant life, salvation that, that overflows, if you want to experience the strength of God, the protection of God, all of this comes through his anointed one. He is the one, the Messiah. Anointed one, another term for Messiah. And then finally, look now at verse 9. It says, Hoshia et Amecha, which means he saved his people. He saves, literally, he saves your people. That's what God does. He saves your people. Secondly, it says, and he will bless your inheritance. Now, I want to conclude this by, by going back to that primary characteristic of, of Hebrew poetry. I hope you all know what that is. Parallelism. And we haven't really said much about that in this, but there's much parallelism in all the Psalms. This is no exception. But I just want to point it out in the last verse. What we see is Hoshia. Hoshia is him making salvation. So he will make salvation, and David is speaking to that, about that, to God. And your people are the people of God. 
So we could simply say that God will save his people. Oh God, you will save your people. Notice here there's a relationship between salvation and what it says in the next half of this verse. Uvarech. Uvarech. This is a word for bless. So God, what the laws of Hebrew poetry demands is this. Why does God save a person? Well, based upon this verse, verse 9, we can conclude he saves a person in order to bless them. Now, that should give you comfort. It should give you confidence when you are in a a time of opposition, hardships, trials, affliction, when God seems very distant, that he seems that he's not hearing your prayer. There's no response. Wait. Be patient. Sometimes we're called to suffer long. But in the end, we can have assurance that God will save us. He will deliver us in order to bless us. And finally, we see that parallelism between your people and what's parallel to to your people, your inheritance. And what we see here is that we are, his people, is the very inheritance of God. So God is going to do what? He is going to receive us unto himself. We are his inheritance. And because of that, we again, we have assurance. We're not going to be removed away from him. I'll close with this. One of my favorite passages is in John chapter 10. He talks about Yeshua being that unique shepherd. And there we have that, that that we are, are in the hand of God. And what does Messiah say? It says, no one is going to snatch you out of my Father's hand. We're also in the hand of Messiah. So what it's saying here is that God himself, he's got a, a double hold on us. And we have a promise that no one ever is going to snatch us, take us, remove us from the hand of God. God has promised he's not going to cast us away, nor is God going to just let us, uh, you know, fall due to carelessness, due to being unaware of something. We drop something, we misplace something. It's like sand that, that goes through our fingers. Not at all. God will never leave us nor forsake us. He will never cease to acknowledge that new covenant relationship. That's what we learn about prophetically and in the new covenant. That covenant has been secured for eternity by what? The very blood of his only begotten son, Messiah Yeshua. Therefore, I can have assurance. And that assurance is going to manifest itself in many different ways for the life of the believer. But but one way that assurance is going to move in my life is that it is going to give me a great incentive to pray. You can see how much faith that you have by how much you pray. There is spiritually an inherent relationship between the emphasis you put on prayer, literally how you pray, how often you pray, what you pray for, and the, the, the type of faith that you possess. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.